welcome from Humboldt University, Berlin, Professor Jochen Kluber. Thank you very much. Oh, there's a... Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. Um, I really only have a very brief, few brief remarks uh, from a labor economist's perspective on some of the issues that were mentioned today. Um, specifically, my starting point is uh, the phenomenon that, that Michael Osborne described this morning as part of his lecture, um, what we call, what economists call the skill bias technological change. So a phenomenon that started in the 70s, 80s, and that essentially means there's a shift in technology, and that shift in technology favors skilled over unskilled labor by uh, increasing the relative productivity of the skilled labor and therefore its relative demand. So the key driver of this phenomenon is that skilled labor is a complement to, to, the, to the switch in technology, therefore we need the skilled labor to run the technology, whereas at the same time unskilled labor is a, is a substitute. So the, 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 the technology substitutes for uh, unskilled labor. This is the, the foundation of this phenomenon that we see and that has been reinforced by the digital revolution. Um, I want to talk about two implications that this has, or two, two, two aspects, um, uh, both at an individual level and at a public policy level. So the two key aspects, I think, that are related to this are first, skills, and second, uh, flexibility. So skills, this is, a, this is an issue that we've uh, mentioned a couple of times already uh, during the morning session. Um, at the individual level, it's become clear from the, from the results that Dr. Deisner showed you uh, on, on the youth, uh, European Youth Survey that the, youth, the young, they're eager to learn, they're ready for uh, increasing their education to live up to the skill bias technological change. From the public policy perspective, um, there probably even are a couple of things that still need to be, uh, need to be tackled, right? Um, so of course, from economics now and psychology literature, a lot of, a lot of um, interdisciplinary research, we know that skill formation starts at very young ages. You know? So there's a public policy case can be made that we need to start even at, the, at early childhood, thinking about how, how, to, uh, uh, how to create, uh, how to design our education, full educational cycles. Um, at the same point, at the same time, I think there's also a point that can be made for more immediate intervention that relates to the question that Mr. Kolawa had this morning. We can't wait 15 years, right, to adjust our educational system for full cycle education because technology will be much faster. Um, at a recent event uh, where Dr. Deisner presented, the, presented uh, the study by the Vodafone Institute, a point was made that in Germany, for instance, among the 16 federal states, only three have computer science as part of their curricula, right? So you, you, know, you see, there's a, there's a very immediate action that you, can, that you can start with doing, putting this on the curriculum, putting this on the agenda, where it can even help uh, uh, young students who are now 15 years of age, and they will benefit from that only within only one, two, three years' time. Um, so, as regards skills, this will be an important part. As regards flexibility, so flexibility, um, there, there are probably three dimensions that relate to the, 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 the this discussion of a digitalized world. So the first one is the flexibility at the individual worker level, um, and also there from the survey and other sources, we know that generally the young generation is ready for that. They know they're going to be mobile citizens, they're going to be a large, a large share of them. They're going to be moving between jobs. They're going to move across countries, part of them. So this is, this, is, this is relatively clear that this will be a trajectory. A second dimension of flexibility uh, would be workplace flexibility. So we see how a workplace uh, have developed. So I'm going to, here, uh, I'm going to have a brief graph for you. Um, this is some data I took from the National Study of uh, Employers in the, in, the, in the United States. So if you think of flexibility, workplace flexibility, there are three parts to it. So um, um, when do you work? Where do you work? How much do you work? Um, regarding the first two uh, things, these are there are a couple of indicators uh, collected in these data. But two are the, regard time management. So, for instance, how free, freely workers are able to choose um, the start-stopping time, their breaks, etc. There's also a data on overtime. Um, the general pattern here. So, these are the, the employers that respond. Um, I provide this to at least some of my workforce. Well, numbers are lower if, if you restrict that to all of the workforce, but for some of the workforce, and you can see these are relatively high levels and they've been increasing. What has also been increasing is regarding the question, where do you work? So uh, the, the flexibility to occasionally work from home, this is something that has been increasing, whereas at the same time, the, the flexibility to regularly allow workers to work from home, this is something that's been relatively flat over a long time. 
There's obvious reasons behind that. If we're into it, we can get back to, uh, into that more further in the discussion. So there's some flexibility trends and others that are relatively flat. Other things that are also relatively flat is about the, uh, the working time arrangements. So the first, so this part here, full-time, part-time switch, this means the question to what, uh, to what extent do employers allow their employees to work full-time, then switch to part-time, then switch back to full-time, remaining in the same type of position with the same type of tasks, right? So this is something that has, if at all, maybe decreased a bit. Of course, clear, these are the 2008, 2012 surveys, so there's some crisis uh, effect behind these figures. And also, if we're looking at compressing work, work is there flexibility in the hours of work over the work week? So also here, uh, this is something that's remained relatively flat. So there are some aspects that are improving. Um, they will probably improve more uh, as we move into a more digitized world, but some, um, for various reasons, remain relatively flat. The third type of flexibility, no, individual flexibility, workplace flexibility, is um, how flexibly are market, flexible are markets or labor markets, right? Um, and I have a graph here uh, I'll put up about labor market flexibility. These are a lot of OECD countries. I'm fully aware you can't grasp this. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm going to show what the, what the message of this graph is. So we got all lots of OECD countries. This is the timeline 2000, from 1990 uh, up to now. And this is an OECD index for restrictiveness of labor market institutions. So how flexible is the market? Yeah. So generally, we think that the further a country is down here, the better it is, and the higher, the worse, right? Because this is an environment down here that enables a lot of innovat innovativeness, et cetera. So unsurprisingly, the country that's down here is the US, this is Canada, this is the UK, I think Australia is next. So these countries that we generally also associate with this idea of a, of a very uh, innovative and, and moving business environment. Uh, the general message here, I think, is, is if you think, I put this up here, is this, is this our learning curve? I mean, 30 years, no, sorry, 20 years, and you should, we should see this going down, right? We know more, we need more flexibility on the labor market to generate a good business environment, but generally this is really flat. So once a country is set somewhere here, they don't, really, they don't really change much. The ones that do change are the ones that were forced to do so because of the crisis, right? Or because of the European Commission and for, forced them to do it. So this is Portugal here. I think this is Italy. Spain is somewhere here as well. So that's when they started cutting and making their labor markets less restrictive. And of course, this, is, this, this, this has important implications. Now, if we connect, um, now maybe one thing I want to say about this connecting to what, what Chancellor Merkel this morning said. So this idea that she mentioned that we, we want to think about doing something like uh, um, um, startup regulations that are the same across the European Union, all countries. Yeah? I think that's, generally, that's the right way to go. These are the, the ideas that you need to bring down this kind of inflexibility in some labor markets. And because if we connect the two, the skills and the flexibility. So on the one hand, we need the public, we, there's a public policy case for improving our education systems to make sure we, people are provided the cognitive skills, the ICD skills for the modern world. But at the same time, we also need an economic environment where these skills can really, well, bloom and develop themselves into, into new uh, and, and emerging uh, business. Thank you.